All right, good morning. That's useless. Anyway, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Fenton. We're glad that you could be with us today. If it's your first time or first time in a long time, in the front of your pew is a just a visitor's card. If you'd like to take that, you could hand it out to the Welcome Center, or there is a box out in the back, and I promise you we will not spam your email or call you unnecessarily. We will just send deacon after deacon to your home. <clears throat> Kidding. Welcome to our church. Uh, we are not normal, but you will realize that more than once in our service. Just a couple quick announcements if you have your bulletins. Um, uh, just a couple, Pastor Cody works uh, real hard. Pastor Cody is our family's pastor. He puts together a family resource table for families uh, to help you as parents navigate um, our, our world. And there's a lot of really good stuff that answers a lot of really tough questions, especially with you guys that have kids and teenagers or the tweenagers. And uh, Pastor Cody works real hard out there. So there's a table out there that has all of our family events. Sarah Halsey leads our counseling ministry. There's several lay counselors in our church, so if you are walking through a difficult time, there is no need to walk through it alone. There are several people that would love to walk through it with you, and so you could reach out to her or myself or any of the leaders that are mentioned on the back. Uh, Joy Club, January 9th. That's tomorrow. Pam, anything special you want me to say? Five o'clock, please sign up, or we'll send deacons to your house. Okay. <laughs> That's per Pam, per Pam. <laughs> Welcome Center um, uh, is out, out there. If you would like to bring any refreshments, uh, snacks, anything like that uh, throughout the year, that's a great ministry. Uh, if you're looking to get involved in ministry, bringing snacks. Is there a better ministry than just bringing a snack bringer? What do you do in the church? I'm the snack bringer. That's like the, <laughs> you'd be the most popular person in the whole church. Um, there's the church potluck is on the 29th. The 29th is we are going to have our family meeting. I'm going to I'm going to make a pastoral decision. I'm going to get rid of the word business meeting. Can I do that? Because we're a big family, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna we have a lot to cover that morning. We have nominations and deacons and uh, tre uh, treasurers and all of the nominated positions. It's an exciting time. Um, I'm really excited. I feel like this is the first year we're kind of getting on track since we went through several years of COVID and all of the difficulties we walked through with that. So it's exciting to, uh, get, to get some of those things going. On, on that topic, after church, we are going to be having an outreach meeting. Uh, so Chris Petty and myself and uh, a couple others, we will be having an outreach meeting. That includes uh, things like men's ministry, women's ministry, um, uh, church events, community events, senior events, joy club, counseling. There's several areas of ministry where we try to reach and love our community. So if you want to get involved in any of those things or help in any of those things, we would love to be able just to share. Even if you, even if you just want to learn more about it, we're going to meet. Chris, you want to meet up? Is Where's Chris? Chris? I know he's here. He's out here. We're going to just meet up here. And uh, so after the service, so about five, ten minutes after the service, if, you're in, if you want to be involved with outreach and helping any of those, we would love to have you up here. And uh, after you leave the service, uh, there is going to be, our directory is completed. And so there are several people that work extremely hard on that, and we're extremely thankful. And, uh, for, and so that's been a tough thing, and so especially with all the shifting parts in the last couple of years. So the directory, and so if you want an updated directory, they, uh, they are going to be out, at the, out when you leave. You can't miss them. They're going to hold you hostage, okay? And I think that is it. Lori wants to make, say, did you hear that? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I was on the way to ask, has she always been that bossy, Andy? Yeah, that's how she, she wasn't going to let me go. She <coughs> <coughs> just making sure you didn't forget. I didn't forget. <laughs> Lori has a... I, what do I have? An short. Oh, no, no, I'm kidding. So, uh, so church family, just wanted to make a special note for everybody here. Um, the Bible talks about giving honor to whom honor is due. And um, since I was in my mother's belly, <laughs> um, Barrick's family up here in the blue, he's been playing the guitar. Barrick, you want to wave? And so, yeah, and all the Ben Dixon kids wave, so they know who, who you're, yep. Uh, they're all leaving on Saturday and moving to Florida, and this is their last Sunday here. So as a church family, I wondered if we could just um, 
give some honor and some recognition to Barrick and his family. They've been serving here faithfully, and I'd just like to give them a, more, uh, a warm uh, round of applause real quick. We love you guys. We're going to miss you a lot. I've especially been blessed uh, to know of the Ben Dixon family. Uh, my mom and Barrick's dad taught at Rochester Hills Baptist Schools, and that's where they met. And so I've been able to be friends um, with Barrick and his family for a long time and now best friends with his wife, Amanda. And I just wanted to say that I'm really going to miss you guys a lot. And I really am thankful to God for you and for your friendship. And I'm especially thankful for your family, um, Barrick, and for all the kids and I love what you guys have helped us create here. And the joy of the Lord is always on your face when you walk in. And our church family is really going to miss you a lot. We're going to feel that. So um, thank you for your faithful service here. And you're always welcome when you come to Michigan, which I hope is a lot. And uh, we love you guys. And Lord bless you on your new adventures. <clears throat> All right. Let us pray. And then we will. Uh, are you done? I'm finished. Okay. <laughs> I didn't <clears throat> know if there was going to be a. All right, let's pray, and then we will start with our scripture reading. Father, we are so thankful for your mercy to us, Lord. We are, all of us, are undeserving of your kindness in our lives, your love for us, and your grace that is bestowed upon us. And so, Father, as we gather as a family, Lord, I just pray that you would be glorified. Lord, there are so many things that can discourage us, frustrate us, hurt us, burdens that we carry. Uh, Lord, so many things that w will go unnoticed today, but Lord, none of them go unnoticed to you. Father, you see every heart, you see every burden, you see every tear, you, you, you see it all and you care. And so, Father, as we begin our worship, Lord, I pray that our hearts would have freedom uh, to worship, to sing, to read, to be encouraged, to be built up, to learn about you. And Father, that we would be more like Jesus, the kind and compassionate Savior that you call us to be. So, Father, as we gather here this morning, let everything be done for your glory, and I pray that we would see you for who you are, and it would change us into your likeness. We pray these things in Christ's name. Paul. Um, we're going to read a lengthy passage, and, and, and you're going to see, today we're going to be looking at God's omniscience, and through all the songs we sing, the, the readings, and the, the songs afterwards, they're speaking to this truth. And so I, I, as you read, don't just read it, but absorb it, okay, and, and grasp these words. It's a little lengthier of a read today. So let us read the Psalms 139. We'll begin in verse 1. Let us read together. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utter parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. 
When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men. For they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O oh Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there are any be. And lead me in the way everlasting. All right, Psalms 139 this morning. As we start our series of the attributes of God, it's hard to choose which attribute to start with. <laughs> there, there's, there's so many, and it's, it's, it's hard to figure out how many attributes should we preach through. And uh, because trying to reveal to us who God is is unsearchable. It's unsearchable. And, but one of the most comforting ones to me is God's omniscience. It reveals to us who he is, and, but also understanding who God is reveals to us um, how we should live our faith, how our faith responds. And God's omniscience is one of those things that I remind my heart of often, often. And so we're going to be looking at Psalms 139, and we're going to be looking at several passages today. So um, I don't have most of them on the screen, but uh, we're going to be defining what omniscience is. We're going to look at the evidence of God's omniscience in the scriptures, and we're going to just look at how this works, how this implies to our life. In Psalms 139, this is David's response to his relationship with God. And, and you could sense, even as we read that psalm earlier in the service, that there was a tremendous amount of emotion towards God and um, passion. But what you see in this psalm is a beautiful display of David's heart to God. David, what you saw in this was God's deep care for David. Did you see that in that passage that we read? We saw that God has a deep care, not only for David, but for each and every one of us. And the thing that is amazing about that passage, it's not just sometimes, it's just not when we're really good or if we're religious or if we're really good moral people that God cares for us. No, God cares for us every single step of our life. That should bring tremendous encouragement to us. Let's look at what God's omniscience means and then we'll look at some of the scriptures. Let's just read a couple, let's read, I'll read just a couple verses and then we'll, we'll look at it. Look what he says here. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar off. You comprehend my path, my lying down, and you're acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before, and you laid your hand upon me. What was David's response to all those truths? This knowledge is what? It's too hard for me to comprehend. But when you, when you see that break in the Psalms, when you, when you, this is like, imagine if there was just a, a Selah attached to that. This is a, a ponder these things that I just saw about God, that I just, that I just revealed to God about how he interacts with us, that every step from our rising up to our going down, every way that we do, every step of our life, God is intimately knows and cares about every aspect, to even every word of my tongue. That he has gone before me and hedged me both behind and in front. This knowledge is, is surpasses all that I can attain. But listen to this definition. I love this definition of omniscience. Look what it says. It says, God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything. He knows everything from the very beginning, and nothing is a surprise to him. Nor does he ever come, now well, listen to this. Nor does God ever come into a possession of new knowledge. Wow. God never has to learn anything. He never has to come into possession of new knowledge. Thus, God knows 
all people perfectly and individually. Man. Sometimes when you preach about this stuff, you just want to like say five words and be done and just let you think about it. But foreknowledge, there's a difference between omniscience and foreknowledge, and we'll look at that in the next couple of weeks. It means more of an intellectual knowledge. But his omniscience means that God knows us in a unique and special and intimate way. Think about it for a moment. You, as a person, God knows everything about you in a very intimate way, and his emotions are aroused towards every step of your life. Every word that comes off of your tongue. He has an intimate relationship with you. Do you always feel like that? Not always, do we? It means God knows us in a unique and special way. In grace, in this life, and for all eternity. This reveals to us that God is the initiator, and redemption has to rise from God and not from man. Wow. Omniscience is this term that refuses to the, the quality of having a complete and unlimited knowledge. In context, it means that he knows all things. Think about this. He knows all things in the past. He knows everything perfectly in the present. Think about this. This should dissipate all of your worries. God has perfect knowledge of everything that will happen in the future. All the way to the very end of time, he has perfect knowledge and will never have to learn anything or come in to possess new knowledge, even in the future. Wow. This knowledge is intimate. It's detailed. It means every person, every place, everything, every star, every galaxy, every moon, every ant, every sand on the sea, every hair of your head, God has an intimate knowledge of. Psalms 147, I love this. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is what? It's infinite. God not know, only knows what, uh, whatever has happened in the past in, in every part of his vast domains, but he is also thoroughly acquainted with everything that is now transpiring in your present day life, in your life, and in the entire universe. God is fully acquainted with everything, all knowledge, he has a full and complete understanding of it all. He is also perfectly cognizant of every event from the least to the greatest that will happen in the ages to pass and in the ages to come. God's knowledge of the future, think about this with me, God's knowledge of the future is as complete as his knowledge of the past and present, and that because the future depends entirely upon himself. You know how many of our anxieties and our fears and the sleepless nights happen in our lives? Why? What do we worry about the most in our life? Doesn't it? Any of you as spiritual as me and you lay awake and worry? I forgot, you're holy Baptist. You don't worry. You don't sin. I worry. Worry is like a besetting sin of mine. I feel a pain in my hip. I Google it, and I'm going to die tomorrow. <laughs> you know what brings me peace? God knows fully my tomorrows. It's going to happen exactly how he planned it to happen in eternity past. Why worry, James? Why let your heart be troubled? Why stay awake at night acting like your worrying is actually going to do anything? Listen to this. If it were possible for anything to occur apart 
from either the direct agency or the permission of God, then that something would be independent of him and he would cease to be the supreme being. Nothing, nothing, nothing in your life happens independently outside of God's hand and plan. Nothing. What did the Bible say about it? That's where you really want to hear. You don't want to hear my opinions and stories. Look at, we're just going to look at Psalm, one, Psalm 147, 5. Just let these sink into your heart. Let, this is a sermon I want you to meditate. Okay? I, want, I want that God's spirit just, just speak into your heart through his word. Look what it says in verse 5. We, we read it, but great is our Lord and mighty in power. This, this verse reminds us that God's knowledge is beyond our measure, meaning that he knows everything there is to know. Look at with me in Isaiah 46. Look what it says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. What does he do? Look at, look at the next verse in verse 10. Declaring what? When does God declare the end? Man, think about that. Think about your faith and what you're placing your faith into with God. God look what he's saying. I am God. What do I do? My knowledge is infinite. My power is unlimited. I declare the end, not as I see it going and I'm making decisions as I go. Well, this, no. He's not response. He's not responding. He's not reacting. He's planning and orchestrating. He's ordaining. What is he planning? He's planning the end from the very beginning. And from the ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel will stand. And look at this, look at this proclamation. Look at the statement of power. Not only, not only is his omniscience on display, but his power and ability to accomplish what he knows and has planned. Look what he says. My counsel will stand, and what will he do? I will do absolutely everything that I have planned from the beginning. Think about how your life fits into that. Does that mean that God has planned and ordained every rising up and, and laying down every step, everything behind and before you? as every part of your life planned? by a sovereign, unlimited, and omniscient God? If you die in a car accident tomorrow, is that the plan of God? If you get terminal illness and it's cancer, was that part of his plan? Yes. If someone betrays you, if there's a Judas in your life and someone hurts you and, 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 and someone abuses you or think these things that happen in our life, listen to me, God knows all of these things. That means he knows all of our pain associated with these things. All of our anxieties, all of our fears. He has perfect, intimate knowledge of all of these things. He knows and he understands. This is our God. says, I will accomplish my purpose. Is there anyone going to stop God from accomplishing it? No. Psalms 139, we, we read. Let, let's, let's look at, um, we read that. Let's look at Matthew 10. I love this passage. Look at this knowledge. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from what? What did it just mention here before we go to the next part? What did it just mention, God's knowledge? What happened in this verse? It's real simple. A bird died, right? Plain language. Why did it die? Why does he mention a sparrow? The, the sparrow, is, it, it, it's, it's the picture of the most insignificant things in this life, things that we wouldn't even think about. That you, you probably pass by thousands of sparrows a day. How many of you all remember every one? 
It's something that our minds won't even comprehend. It's something that we don't even think about. But God says that even the most minute sparrow in all of the, uni- all the universe, even down to the most insignificant matter, it happens because of my will. Wow. So what does this do? What does this do for us? Not two sparrows, one will fall. But look at the next part of this verse. Now, I won't get, give you the por- corny pastor joke that goes along with this. You guys all know it. <laughs> I am very tempted to do it. So, okay. <laughs> Some of you, it's easier than others to count the name on your head. <laughs> you know it's coming. I couldn't resist. <laughs> That's like in the pastor protocol. When they read that verse, you've got to mention it. <laughs> Sorry, I ruined that verse for you, didn't I? <laughs> but look at this. Not only does he know the sparrow that falls, but he, he attaches this personally. Oh, yeah, that's cool. He knows about the sparrows. That's but then he makes a personal application. What is, he trying to, what is he trying to get you to understand? He says that I know the very hairs on your head. Do you think that God is intimately and deeply aware of you as a person? Isn't it hard, easy to get lost in this chaos of life and to even wonder if God cares? Even if you wonder if he knows, does he even see? Does he even aware of my life? Does he even see my pain? He knows you intimately. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He cares. He cares about the smallest little details of our life. He cares about your balding. He does. <clears throat> he knows every aspect of our lives. And you want to know something even more peaceful? Not only does he know, but he's in control. There's two reactions to that. There's an anger when we, we respond to his authority like that, we don't like some of the things that God allows. Right? You ever been angry at God? Yeah? You ever doubted him? Yeah? Where, where do we usually do this? Where do we usually find ourselves angry and doubting God's goodness? It's in our suffering, right? It's when God allows things to happen in our life that we don't agree with. We don't like. We don't see how this could be good. Right? So sometimes we respond in anger and doubt. But there's other times, and this is how we should respond, in complete peace. You know why? I don't have the answers to everything in life. Do you? And it's much easier to me to find comfort in knowing that my God is all-powerful, he's omniscient, he knows everything, and he cares about everything than to live my life devoid of God's authority and just say life is just this random element of molecules and everything just randomly happens. It's much more comforting to know that even though I don't understand, my God does understand. Look at with me in Psalms 33. I have too many verses. 13 through 15 here. Psalms 33 Look what it says. The Lord looks down from heaven, and he sees the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. Look what he says. Think about this. This might, you might struggle with this, with your wrestling with this whole doctrine of free will here. I love to wrestle with you guys. What does it say about what he does with men's hearts in a position of authority? I love this next word, though. He fashions their hearts what? Do you ever think about that? That God has created you unique, special, individually fashioned by God? And what does he do? 
He fashions their hearts. And he considers what? But I'm just so insignificant. You know, God's just too busy. He really doesn't care about me. Those are all lies. Those are all lies. He sits upon his position of authority. He looks over all of mankind because he fashions their hearts. And look at this word. He considers. What do you think of that word when you hear considers? It's not just, well, he sees all your works. This, this, is, this word considers in, in, in Hebrew, it, it means to carefully ponder with response of emotion. It means to dwell upon. In the New Testament, in, in the book of Hebrews, it, it, it tells us that he has been acquainted with all of our griefs in every way he has been tried like us. He knows all of our pain, does he not? So listen to me. All of your pain, all of your suffering, all of your doubts, all of your angers, all of, all of every part of your life, every aspect of it, God considers it all. He knows, he sees, he feels, he's directly tied with you as an individual in every aspect, every tear that you cry, every worry that you lay awake with at night, God is acquainted with it all. All of those deepest sorrows, all of those unknowns, all of those anger of emotions, all of these things that we have, he knows them and sees them and even is, feels them individually on our behalf. Isaiah 55. I love, I, we just do this every week. Just first, talk about God. Verse, it's that simple. It's so good, isn't it? Not my preaching's good. Just the Bible's good. <laughs> I know my preaching's not The Bible's good, isn't it? Just verse by verse, just like this. For my thoughts are what? <laughs> you know what I have in my Bible? That word not highlighted it and underscored. You know why? Sometimes I go, God, I, I, I don't know what you're doing and why you're doing it this way. God, if you want my opinion, this is what I would do. This is how it all work out. And if you did it this way, God, and I, I, just, I just write him a detailed list. And it never pays attention to my opinions. <laughs> why? My thoughts are not your thoughts. And your ways are what? Don't we want to control our lives? Do you? Do you like to control your life? How much, how much of you would, you would you like to be able to pick and choose what happens in your life? Every aspect of it. That's a trick question, Patrick. Don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Get yourself in trouble. But think about it. Think about it. How foolish would that be? That would be the most unloving thing God could ever do is let us pick and choose. Wouldn't it? Because you know what we're saying when we do that in our lives? I know better than the infinitely wise, omniscient, all-powerful, sovereign creator of all the universe. I know better. Okay, Satan, right? <laughs> I ascended to glory. I became like the most high. But isn't that true? And even when we respond in our suffering, man, this is what we say. God, I know better. God, that wasn't good. God, that wasn't right. God, that wasn't fair. You shouldn't have done it that way. Because you didn't do it my way, I'm going to question your very existence. Well, when you put it like that, Pastor, right? In these verses, God reminds us that his ways, his thoughts, and his actions are higher and better than ours. 
it is better to trust in God than to trust in our man, ourselves. Our world would be chaos if we got to pick and choose. This is where, because he knows all things beyond our comprehension, doesn't he? He sees things that we can't. But this is where our faith comes in. You know, faith isn't just doing religious stuff. You do, the, you do know that, right? Faith comes into play when we live. How we respond to and how we react to things of our life. Faith isn't just being moral. Faith isn't just being religious. Faith isn't just being part of some, uh, some religious organization. Faith comes into play when we choose to trust ourselves or we choose to trust God. Right? It is better to trust God than it is to trust in ourselves in our own ways, is it not? Is it not better to trust and say, I don't know why God did this, I, but I trust that he's omniscient and he knows what is best and he's wise and he's good and I'm going to trust him instead of trying to figure it out all on my own? So anyway, what does this all mean? The fact that God sees every aspect of our lives at first may leave us afraid and eager to hide from God. Rather than to be in awe of Him. But listen to me. The fear of God. The fear of God is not like scared. It's, wow, this is who you really are. It's, it's, a, it's not like, oh, I'm so scared. It's, wow, this is who you are. You're beyond my comprehension. This is, it's an awe factor of who God is. This fear makes us both aware of God's holiness, but also aware of his patience and forgiveness. Let this speak to your heart for a moment. I'm a bad person. <laughs> I am. So are you. I'm much worse than you know. You see me and pastor and preacher and best looking husband and father of the year. And you see all those. Let me tell you something. That's not who I am. There are things, if you could see what I think about, if you could see the times of anger and bitterness and being cynical that rise in my heart. If you could see sometimes how I fail as a dad, as I fail as a husband, if you could see all of these things that happen right here, you wouldn't want to hear a thing. This is the beauty of this, though. God knows the deepest, darkest parts of all of my heart. He knows my deepest pains, my deepest fears, my deepest worries. He knows things that I don't even know. He knows my motives. He, and you know what? He still chose for me to become a vessel of his grace. He saw the absolute worst in me. He saw every sin that I committed in the past, every sin that I commit today, and all of my failures of tomorrow, and he still chose me to be a vessel of his grace. <laughs> why? I'm not so worried of why he chooses to allow bad things. Why did he choose me at all is the real question. Why? You know me. You see my deepest pains. You see all of my sin, yet you still love me. That, my friends, is the response of grace. <laughs> Not to run and hide from God. This causes us to realize that we have no reason to run in fear of God especially because there's nowhere to run. <laughs> right? Didn't we see that in the psalm? If I awake in the heavens, you are there. If I find my grave to be in hell, guess what? You're there also. Listen to me, there's nowhere to 
to run from God's presence. There's no place to run. It's beyond his gaze. Instead, we should look to him, not run from him. So what does that mean for us? I, I, I have a New Year's resolution to be on time in every one of my services this year. You're not supposed to laugh so hard at that. <clears throat> Romans 8, 28. I love this, and it's so important to us. What, what does it say? All things work together for good. God cares for us deeply and thoroughly. He need, look at with me in verse 1 through 4. You can highlight them. I don't have time to read them in this passage, 139. But he knows every step we take, and he knows every word we speak. This is a comforting reminder of how closely God watches over us and how deeply he cares for us. Every word and every step, individually. It reminds us it is easy to feel alone and forgotten, doesn't it? Doesn't it? For those that are widowed and widowers, doesn't it feel easy to feel alone and forgotten? You are not alone. Every step from behind and before, every word, every thought, God is infinitely near to you. Verses 13 and 16. This is a powerful truth. God has numbered all of our days. Before they even began, before we were even formed, God had numbered our days. Let me tell you something really encouraging. You're going to die when God planned for you to die. <laughs> Quit worrying about it so much, James. <laughs> you ever do that? Worry about, what if I'm going to get sick? What if I'm going to do this? Now, I'm not telling you to go be unwise and lick doorknobs and do all kinds of crazy stuff like that. But this should give you great peace, right? Should get, you could die tomorrow in a car accident or you could live to your old as Mark. I don't know. <laughs> Mark and Moses go way back. I mean, it's just... But it shows God's incredible care and attention for us. Seven, verses 7 through 12. No matter where we go, no how, matter how much we hurt or how much we uh, feel alone, God's Spirit is always with us. We are never, ever alone. It reminds us that God knows what we are going through and is able to always provide comfort and guidance. Always. Verses 17 through 18. What does this do for us? It reminds us of our great and glorious God that cares so intimately for creatures like you and me. <laughs> Not, do you ever think about that? Like, see ourselves. But then to think, God in all of his vastness, beyond our comprehension, cares intimately, individually for you and me. What does this do for our relationship with him, understanding his omniscience? It should create a great desire in your heart for you to run to him. Not avoid him, not hide from him. Not wait till you can become super religious like Pastor James and then you can come to God. No, no, no. This attribute of God reveals God to us in his perfectness and all of his power. But it, the reason I love it so much because it's the most gracious and kind offer. God knows everything about us and yet still chose to bestow his love upon us as mankind. It's the greatest offer for all of us to come. No matter how much you hurt, come. No matter how much you fear, come. No matter how much you, you're consumed with unforgiveness and anger, come unto me and I will give you rest. Take all of your burdens, take all of your fears, take all of your worries, take all of your self-righteousness, all of your religion, and throw it all away and come to me open with nothing to hide, for I am God and I know all things about you. I care for you. Come to me. Because... 
in David's response. What was his prayer? It's kind of silly. But look at now the context as he closes this. Search me, O oh God. Wait a minute, David. He already knows you. <laughs> what does this mean? God, reveal to myself. God, I know who you are. I struggle too in who I really am. We think much highly of ourselves than we ought to. God, reveal to me. God, help me to see all of the, my heart the way you see it. Try me, God. Help me with my anxieties. Reveal to me if there's any way, wicked way in me. And what, what does it say? Lead me into the way of everlasting. Every attribute what we, that we look at, how does it always lead us? What does it lead us to? Worship. God, I see myself for who I am. I see you for who you are. Now lead me into your way of everlasting, the way of obedience, the attributes of God. And all, and all the scriptures always lead us to worship through obedience, which is true worship. You cannot accurately follow God or worship him correctly if you don't know him. So my prayer is today is that God and his omniscience would be a great comfort to you, but also a great challenge to come to him. There's nothing you're hiding from him. Come. Come. Let's pray. Father, so much truth. God, so much about you, so many verses, so much to absorb. God, our, our minds are limited. Lord, we see you through a veil, through a glass that's dimmed. And God, I, I just pray, Lord, in my frailty of words, in my limitations of speech, Father, that your spirit would be the illuminating light in our hearts, that we would see the character and the attributes of God, and they would shine bright in our lives, that that light would dispel all of the darkness for in our hearts. The darkness is, exists because the absence of light. And Father, I pray that today's word would be light to our hearts, light to our souls, that it would reveal to us our hearts, reveal to us our wicked ways, but Lord, that it wouldn't just leave us in despair and burrowing in our sin, but it would lead us into a life of the everlasting way, a life of peace, a life of joy amidst all of the trials of life. Father, I pray for the person under my voice today that is alone, that is isolated, that feels forgotten. God, would you allow your spirit to comfort them now? that your spirit would reveal to them that they are not alone, that they are deeply and wonderfully cared for and loved. Father, for the person in here who struggles with the choices that you've decreed, that you've ordained, whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's a terminal illness, whether it's unforgiveness in a past, whether it's a current circumstance, God, that they haven't fully surrendered over to you, God, I pray that your word would be light to them. Lord, that they would see the forgiveness that you offered, that you knew us fully, yet offered your grace. Lord, that they would choose to forgive, choose to trust you, even in the deepest wounds of their heart. Father, that your light would destroy all of the darkness of resentment and bitterness in our hearts. And Father, for those that our hearts have grown cold, like mine. Lord, I pray that this would be a fire that would rekindle our hearts' joy for who you are. God, that it would rekindle a passion for you. And Father, most importantly, that it would rekindle a life of worship, a life of obedience. That all of these things, Lord, would be done for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As you leave here, look around you. Someone needs you today, okay? Someone in here needs you. Ask God. Be sensitive to his spirit. Say, God, who is it that needs me? Needs encouragement, a hug, a handshake, 
a smile and be encouraging to one another as you leave here today. Enjoy your week. I'll see you guys next week. Have a great week. Thank you.